Former President Donald Trump has called for an end to the war in Gaza. You heard that right. In a recent interview with two Israeli journalists, Trump said October 7th was one of the saddest things he's ever seen, but took a departure from many of his fellow Republicans, public, uh, public support for Israeli Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu, saying Israel should end the fighting. Uh, you have to finish up your war. You have to finish it up. You got to get it done. And uh, I'm sure you'll do that. Now we got to get to peace. You can't have this going on. Uh, and I will say Israel has to be very careful because you're losing a lot of the world. You're losing a lot of support. The two Israeli journalists said what they heard from Trump shocked them. So this was a very interesting write-up in the New York Times um, that I flagged yesterday um, with the Israeli uh, people that Trump has met with actually being very concerned that, you know, you can read that almost two ways. When he's saying, you know, finish the job, finish the war in Gaza, one can go to it. Does that mean, you know, a, a great more greater military effort, more militarism? But they're concerned that what he means is not that. What he means is that it's that Israel is starting to embarrass itself on the international stage, lose a lot of its support. Trump knows this is bad for, this could be bad for U.S. security. Um, and I, I, I mean, he's signal, I, he's kind of leaving it ambiguous enough that you can read what he's saying in multiple ways, which is a criticism we've made. But the people who know very much about Israel from the pro-Israeli side are not liking what they're hearing. Right, and, and there's statements that Trump has made that are not ambiguous at all. He got some flack um, from the establishment when immediately after October 7th in his first comments, he was critical of Netanyahu and his failure to have security in place that would have prevented the October 7th attack in the first place. Um, there has been reporting that he has, is still bristling from Netanyahu's uh, acceptance as of Biden as the winner in 2020 and not Donald Trump. Uh, and specifically, these most recent comments have been scrutinized by the two uh, journalists that he was speaking to their um, Israeli journalists, because there was no mention in Trump's remarks of a settler, as a hostage exchange rather, as a condition of ending the conflict. Recall that in every other instance, even when um, you know Biden is talking about you know 30,000 plus civilian casualties, the horror of what's going on for the people of Palestine and Gaza, uh, there is always a kind of preamble about how everything has to be conditioned on a an ex total exchange, a total freedom of all of the Israeli hostages. This is not something that uh, that Donald Trump said here. At all. Yeah, this Times story says again, supporters of Israel um, are parsing every utterance from Mr. Trump, looking for a sign that in a second term, he might not be as reliable an ally as he was in his first term. As you said, his first impulse after October 7th was actually to criticize Netanyahu for security lapses. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very interesting that I, I don't know that Trump is actively going to run on this, but some of the disenchantment with Biden from progressives or anti-war, anti-interventionist voices, you know, maybe the fact that if Trump doesn't even signal that he, you know, he's not going to say anything very substantive on it, but if he signals like, I'm not going to be even harder than Biden on this, in fact, I think we got to bring this to a swift end, that is going to sell people who are already feeling weak on Biden about this to just stay home, right? So the argument here is not that uh, Donald Trump has had a radical change of faith and belief from what he believed when he was president of the United States, when he supported the move of the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem, which um, the international community uh, considers uh, that part of Jerusalem, half of Jerusalem, as occupied territory, Palestinian territory that's occupied by Israel. You obviously have his son-in-law out here, as we covered, I think, in a radar last week or the week before, talking about beachfront development properties in Gaza. So I wouldn't read too deeply into this. What I would read into this is that Donald Trump is a savvy politician who has seen which way the wind is blowing and understands that there is an incredible political liability to backing Israel as it just yesterday uh, bombed a diplomatic facility in Lebanon, uh, bombed a, a famous Western chef's age convoy, killing seven people, including multiple foreign nationals, um, and of course just came out of this two-week siege of Al-Shifa Hospital. And so what he's doing is modulating. Apparently, according to this New York Times article, he has been eagerly enthusiastically consuming reporting about how disgruntled Democratic voters are with Joe Biden. And there, the article suggests that there might even be a move. There, it has been contemplated that he might run ads in 
Michigan and other places with large Arab American populations and populations that are generally upset with Joe Biden over this, emphasizing Joe Biden's commitment to Israel, saying nothing about himself, but really exploiting the rift that is disproportionately affecting the Democratic Party. However, it's worth noting that it's not only Democrats that are upset right now. Majorities of Americans think that uh, Israel has gone too far in Gaza. And this is a, a, a friction that has divided the Republican media sphere, the right-leaning media sphere as well. We've talked about this in the context of Candace Owens and her ouster from The Daily Caller. But most recently, here's a clip between, of an interview between Ben Shapiro and Megyn Kelly, where he's calling him out on whether or not his free speech commitments end at the Israeli border. The accusation is you are until it comes to Israel. How do you respond? I mean, what I will say is that we have a wide variety of positions on Israel right now inside the Daily Wire. Matt Walsh, obviously, is another one of the hosts at the Daily Wire. He and I wildly disagree about what America's Israel policy should be. Matt is much more isolationist. He basically believes the United States has no no real interests in the Middle East, and thus the United States should not be providing material support to anyone, including the state of Israel. You know, Matt obviously is well within you know the 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 sort of group of hosts that we have here at the Daily Wire. So clearly whatever is going on is not about Israel specifically. That's really all I have to say about it. As far as the free speech of it, as I've said before, you know, the, the Daily Wire is a, a publisher, not a platform. I would never call for anyone to be ousted from an actual platform, X, YouTube. I, I, even people who are, I, I think, absolutely horrific human beings, I've never called for any of them to be ousted. In fact, I've called for them to have their accounts restored if they've been banned. Uh, that, that's not the same thing when it comes to publishers. Publishers obviously have to decide what sort of things they wish to pay for the publication of. And, uh, and when it comes to, you know, you know, hosts and, and publishers, you know, parting ways, obviously there will be a non-meeting of the minds. So very interesting clip. Glad to hear Ben Shapiro weigh in on this question. Um, I, look, I think he's right that there is some ideological diversity on this question at the Daily Wire. Matt Walsh is like the superstar of the Daily Wire in addition to Ben Shapiro and does frankly have a different view on this that's more in line with my kind of libertarian right view on this that we should not fund foreign wars, we should not be involved, that's their business, not ours. Um, I'm more in that camp. Candace Owens was in that camp and then some, um, and has obviously parted ways with Ben Shapiro at the Daily Wire's urging. As that answer goes on, I'm not sure he really seals the deal or mm -hmm. sells the package or whatever in terms of explaining why this is not cancel culture, only because so many people on the right have define cancel culture in such broad terms as any time there is any kind of firing that is remotely ideological. Right, again, this is not a First Amendment issue, and we shouldn't conflate the two, because he's absolutely right that she has no right, or nor does anyone else, to work at a company and just, like, they pay you, and if they decide they don't want to pay you anymore, they get rid of you, and that's That's fine, been the case in with instance after some instance, level of labor law, but whether yeah. it's uh, professors that have gotten in conflict with various students and been yeah. let go for ideological reasons, people who've written at papers and been let go for ideological reasons, yeah. and every instance where some liberals have said, well, it's not really cancel culture because they're just losing your job. This isn't, uh, this doesn't involve the government. This isn't a constitutional yeah. well, issue. Well, if they're public universities, it might be. Republicans have pushed back consistently and said, no, basically are making it an argument that because of the cultural, um, uh, the kind of uniformity of cultural beliefs and the, 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 the kind of extent to which liberal cultural values have won the day in the public sphere, that it is constructively a cancellation. So what now does this look like when the predominant perspective on Israel-Palestine has been pro-Israel, along with the predominant yeah. valence of American foreign policy, when you start to get people let go from your institution because they take a contrary view, how is not, that not exactly the kind of thing we've been discussing for years in the cancel culture context? He also gets into that platform publisher distinction, which mm. I think has gotten a little bit confused and is legally is not a separate category of things. People have tried to define social media sites as platforms, not publishers, or then if they engage in any kind of moderation, they're suddenly becoming publishers and they lose access to their Section 230 rights, which is just simply not true, and Section 230 does not distinguish between these two things. And in fact, Twitter is on some level a company just like the Daily Wire is, and making decisions that we can criticize, just as people are criticizing the Daily Wire. If you want to call it cancel culture, fine, um, but you know you ought, you ought to be careful if you're if you're wielding that accusation. Um, you, I, you should probably qualify it a little bit that yeah. we're talking about you know egregious firings for you know for utter nonsense or for just expressing an opinion that is not actually that unpopular is only unpopular among like 
I don't know, super, super elite progressives or something. Um, I, I, I still think the term has some validity, but I'm not sure he's parsed it successfully there. We will, I'm sure, continue to follow these developments. More rising right after this.